Let's start this annotated PowerPoint with a quiz. Oh yeah. So which of the following joints is not a hinge joint? The metacarpophalangeal, the tibiofemoral, the talocrural, the radio ulnar, or the humero ulnar? Pause the video, come back when you're ready. Right, the radio ulnar is a pivot joint. The others are in fact hinge joints. So um, this was a lot more fun in class when I could show you my boutonniere deformity. I asked about this on the uh, homework, so of course you had no way of knowing what was going on. Um, it's a tear of the central extensor tendon. The idea here is just look at a couple of disorders of joints. So this is a somewhat common one called a boutonniere deformity. It's a tear of the central extensor tendon of the digit, a grade three strain. So, so about eight years ago, uh, I was at uh, one of my other jobs that I take from time to time, and I was uh, carrying a big table, um, and I was walking in an area where it was there was a a bank, uh, it was like on loose rock, and I I slipped and I fell, you know, ass over elbows. Um, and I put my hand out to block my fall and if you look in the lower right see that person's uh, little finger on their right hand that's how my hand hit and that kind of injury can cause you to completely shred what's called the central extensor tendon so in the lower left you can see that central extender extensor tendon um, there's a uh, it runs over the proximal interphalangeal joint and then it inserts on the distal interphalangeal joint. So it's used to control the movement of the distal uh, segment of your, of your finger, all right, the distal phalanx. Um, what happens when it shreds is the proximal interphalangeal joint, in other words, the, the middle knuckle in your finger, it pushes through the torn tendon, causes flexion of the, of the PIP, the proximal interphalangeal joint, but then it pulls on the distal interphalangeal joint, so that last joint on your finger, and it pulls it upward. Just like you see the person's hand in the lower right, their little finger on their right hand, that's what it causes your finger to do. Now the thing about that is when it happened, because it happened at work, um, there was workman's comp, so they sent me to the emergency room and the ER doctor looked at it and said, ah, it's no big deal, it's not broken, you know, it just, you know, just rested. Well, I noticed that over the next couple of weeks it, it started to really stiffen up so I went to an actual hand specialist and he said I'm really sorry to tell you this if you'd come and see me the day after we could have fixed this but now it's too late your finger is simply going to be deformed for the rest of your life and that's the way it is my little finger on my uh, left hand now looks like that person's little finger on their right hand so I can't really uh, I can bend it just a little bit but not very much so um, yeah, that's, uh, don't believe the doctor in the emergency room. Always look after yourself, okay? Um, so, uh, it's ca often caused by trauma. Uh, can be a consequence of rheumatoid arthritis. By the way, there you see in the picture on the right, uh, the shape of that person's little finger. That's the way my little finger looks now. Um, and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not fixable anymore because what happens is the, the joint that's bent there, all right, the uh, proximal interphalangeal joint, it has now become a synostosis in my finger. In other words, what happens is the bones simply fuse together. I have one big solid chunk of bone there. Um, and that's what happens when you can't move it anymore. Um, uh, it's called boutonniere deformity because the proximal interphalangeal joint pushes through the central extensor, extensor tendon. You may know, like if you went to prom, um, you have a boutonniere, that's the flower. Uh, it goes through the buttonhole on the lapel, and so that's why it's called a, a boutonniere deformity. Surgery to repair tendon generally not successful unless performed within a few days of the injury. So that's why in my case that doctor didn't tell me that I needed to go to a hand specialist right away. And I normally hate going to the doctor, so I didn't. By the time I finally went, it was too late to do anything to fix it. Okay. And then here, another interesting clinical aspect of joints, something called dead arm and baseball pitchers. And this is actually kind of a fascinating story. It shows you kind of a little bit of the history of medicine here and about the way things work, all right? Everything the way it is right now wasn't always like that, 
Um, things have changed over time. Here's a good example. So this is a, a tear of the ulnar collateral ligament, the UCL, a grade two sprain. So look at the diagram there. You can see that the ulnar collateral ligament is actually composed of a few different parts. It's that middle part. It's the part that connects the ulna to the medial epicondyle of the humerus, all right? A grade two sprain again means that there's a partial tear of that ligament. Um, so yeah, that's where it is. There you go. Just a description of exactly where the ligament is. It laterally stabilizes the elbow joint. So your elbow should never wiggle from side to side. Remember, an elbow is a monoaxial joint, only has that opening closing. If you've got play in your elbow, that's bad. It means you don't have as much control over your elbow. Normally that doesn't happen unless you get a tear in the ulnar collateral ligament. So the tear is generally not very painful, um, but you get a significant loss of velocity and control. So what happened was, it was known for many decades that the, some of the baseball pitchers, especially the ones that threw really, really hard, at some point in their career, they couldn't throw as hard anymore. All right, they, they, had, a, they had a 98 mile per hour fastball and suddenly it dropped down to 92, which most people can't even come close to hitting a 92 mile an hour fastball, but professional baseball players can. A lot of them can hit 92, they can't hit 98. So when you lose the velocity, really it's just speed. Velocity should be a vector, but nobody in baseball knows that. But um, suddenly you're very hittable. Plus, because your elbow wiggles from side to side, you lose control and you can't find the strike zone anymore. Classic example of this was a pitcher by the name of Sandy Koufax, who's considered to be one of the greatest pitchers of all time. And his arm went dead and he ended up retiring. There was nothing to do. Back in the old days when you got dead arm, there was really nothing to do. Before MRI, they couldn't really diagnose it. They didn't know what was even wrong. They just knew that you had dead arm, and that meant that your career was over. Well, there's a pitcher for the Los Angeles Dodgers. His name was Tommy John. And Tommy John was a pretty good pitcher, but he got to the point in his career where he had dead arm, all right? He lost velocity, couldn't find the strike zone anymore. It looked like his career was gonna be over. Well, the Dodgers practiced right across the street, one of their practice fields, was right across the street from the UCLA Medical Center. So one day after practice, Tommy John just walked across the street, you know, went over to the building, just, you know, looked at all the names, you know, picked one out, um, picked an orthopedic surgeon, went to the guy's office and said, hey, my name's Tommy John, I play baseball, I'm a pitcher, my arm's dead, it's gonna be the end of my career, why don't you invent a new technique? I got nothing to lose. Try it on me. If it doesn't work, well, then my career is still over. Well, the guy he talked to was Dr. Frank Joby. This was in 1974. This is actually after I was already out of college, all right? So Dr. Frank Joby came up. He invented a technique, all right? And here's what he decided to do. He took the tendon from the palmaris longus muscle. So there you, uh, let's see right there. There's palmaris longus. So notice how it has a really long tendon. Well, as it turns out, palmaris longus is one of the flexors of your hand, of your fingers. Um, but you actually have three muscles that flex your fingers. Palmaris longus is the most superficial and it's really not a big player at all. In fact, it's so not important that 15% of the population is missing it. You have much more powerful flexors. So it's no big deal to take the tendon from this muscle. And so that's what Dr. Frank Joby did. He just went snip, snip, and cut off that tendon, all right? And then he went in to do surgery. So uh, about 15 to 18 centimeters is what were needed. You have no damn idea how long 15 to 18 centimeters are, do you? You really don't have any idea. Um, there's roughly two and a half centimeters per an inch, so um, one thing you can do is you can multiply by 4 and that gets you close. 4 times 15 is 60, move the decimal point, that's about 6 inches, alright? So about 6 inches of tendon. And then uh, they also now sometimes use the lateral triceps tendon. And what they do is they just, they drill a hole through the humerus and the ulna. And they use a drill just like when you would buy at Home Depot, but you know, since it's a surgical drill, it costs, you know, $2,000. Um, but look what they do. You can see there in the diagram in the upper left, they're going to drill through the uh, 
uh, medial epicondyle there of the humerus and they're going to drill through what's called the coronoid process of the um, uh, ulna and then they're going to take this uh, tendon that they cut off and they just loop it through the holes. They figure eight it. They just wrap it around in a figure eight style fashion around and through and around and through and around and through and then they take some needle and thread and they just sew it up. So you can see in the lower right there's an actual Tommy John surgery in progress and you can see where they sewn that tendon in. They just wrap it around and around. Now the big deal is that this surgery, the recovery time can be one to two years. So you're not going to be pitching for one to two years, but when it finally heals up, sometimes people can throw even faster than they could before. So Tommy John surgery wasn't even invented until 1974. Now not only do they use it for professional baseball players, they're even using it for high school baseball players. Everybody in the world gets Tommy John surgery now. It's like, you know, an assembly line procedure. Some doctors basically just do that. Make tons of money, of course, on it. But um, it's usually, it works pretty well. Um, here is a Steven Strasburg, plays for the Washington Nationals. When he first came up, he was throwing fastballs over 100 miles an hour. And sure enough, within a couple of years, he tore his UCL, had dead arm. But uh, he underwent the Tommy John surgery, and uh, well, he was out of baseball for a year or so. I don't remember exactly. But now he's back, and he's back to being another top-notch pitcher again. So it works. It helps. So that's Tommy John surgery. Again, boutonniere deformity, Tommy John surgery, just showing you a couple of disorders or injuries of joints and, you know, how they can work with stuff like that. All right, we're done with the joints. We move on to the muscles next.